uh, we are in the Book of Romans, so welcome to those who are joining us online as well, and those who uh, listen in later on podcasts and watch on YouTube. Uh, we are in a series of studies about the Book of Romans called Back to the Basics, and the focal point of Romans is really about the basics of our faith. Um, talks a lot about righteousness, and sanctification, and justification, and all those terms that uh, if you were to take a, a, uh, a basic class in college about Christianity that you would uh, get, and so uh, just leave your checks for the college level, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but it is a great book, and uh, we're able to study this together. If you have your Bible with you, turn to Romans chapter 4. And you do have some questions with you there. Uh, I'll try to let you know in one way or another when I'm saying something that is on your questions. Uh, so if you pay attention, hopefully you'll be able to do that easily. And uh, we'll, we'll learn together. Um, first three chapters of Romans have established the facts that Jew, Gentile, even uh, religious people, people who have not given their life to Christ, uh, are bound to sin. And even us as Christians have the capability to sin, though we are not held in bondage to sin. And so uh, that's kind of what has been established. And tonight we're going to look at two characters that are main characters in the Bible. They're Abraham and David. And what uh, Paul is trying to demonstrate here is that uh, there is righteousness does not come through works. Uh, that it comes through faith. That's pretty much, you can almost sum up the whole uh, fourth chapter that way, though we will only go through probably about the first half of this chapter. All right, we're going to read the first three verses, and we'll just keep that pattern. Uh, we'll keep reading it just a few at a time and talk about those verse, verses one through three. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? Now, obviously, Paul is writing this book to former Jews who are in Rome. Uh, they formed a church there, and he is communicating, uh, teaching this as an epistle to them. That's why he says, Our Father, Abraham. Uh, for if Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Have you heard that last little part? I think everybody's shaking their head. That's a very important part of the study tonight. Uh, Abraham believed God. It was not because Abraham was just an awesome guy and automatically followed after the Lord and did everything right. Uh, it was because he believed God. And God says that believing is enough. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Uh, because if not, then we would be bound to works. And works uh, does not, as we learned in the first three chapters, works will never save us. Uh, so we ended last week with Romans chapter 3, verse 31, where Paul asked the question, what happens to the Old Testament or the law since the New Testament talks about faith? And we answered that question by saying that uh, the, New Te the Old Testament or the law has not been done away with, but it has been fulfilled through Christ. And so uh, that's important. That kind of is, that's why he's going now into Father Abraham and talking about this subject of works versus faith. 
So Paul looks to Abraham. Uh, by the way, Abraham, for the Jewish people, is the most esteemed man uh, ever in their religion, in their faith. Kind of uh, maybe equivalent to Abraham Lincoln for us, or George Washington, or someone like that. A very important figure. Uh, if you've read your Bible, you probably have noticed that. Genesis has a huge section on Abraham. So, let's look at this a little bit at a time. For if Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to boast about. So, the author here is saying that if anybody could boast about their works, that it would be Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was true to God. Abraham left when God told him to go. He went to a foreign country and he did everything the Lord asked him to do. Now, was he perfect? We know he wasn't, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, he let people believe that Sarah was his sister, right? Instead of his wife. Uh, all to protect his own skin. So, obviously, not a perfect man. And this is talking about Abraham, but it says if works could justify a man, then, uh, then Abraham would have something to boast about, but he doesn't have anything to boast about. And even if anyone could just be justified by works, then it's at some point we would all fall short of the glory of God. Remember, do you remember? Anybody know where that's found automatically? You have it memorized? Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right? Then it goes on to say, uh, so our works really, I'm, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to quantify it. Our works don't mean anything to God when it comes to salvation or righteousness. However, we are saved unto good works, but not by good works. So once we're saved, then uh, the Bible affirms that we are to do good works. We're to work for the Lord. But that's not what saves us. It's our faith that saves us. Uh, for what does the scripture say? Uh, the scripture tells us that Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. By the way, that's Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, uh, where you'll find that. So Paul is making it clear that Abraham's righteousness did not come from performing good works, but from belief in God. Uh, it, it's a righteousness that is obtained through faith. Questions? Uh, if you were to ask a good Jewish teacher in Paul's day about Abraham, they would argue with Paul on this point. They would say that Abraham was justified by his works. And they would say that somehow that Abraham, before the law was ever written, because the law didn't come until after Abraham, that Abraham somehow anticipated what God was going to say, and he just lived a good life based on that. Well, we know that's not true. Uh, so, uh, in ancient passages, the, the rabbis would say, we find that Abraham, our father, had performed the whole law before it was given. And he was a good man if he could do that, right? Uh, and Abraham was perfect in all of his deeds before the, before the Lord. That's what the rabbis of that day would have argued um, and would have denied what Paul was saying here. Uh, so the Jewish teachers of Paul's day would, would have believed that Abraham was justified by his works. So, it may sound like semantics, but I want to point out a couple of uh, something. Notice that Abraham was not made righteous in all of his doings, but God accounted Abraham as righteous. There's a difference. Abraham was not made 
righteous, he was accounted righteous. What's the difference? Whether he actually lined up with all the law and did everything perfectly, God still said, I'm going to take that as good enough because of what? Because of his faith, right? Accredited, yes. Yes. Uh, accounted is uh, one of the words. If you, uh, he's, uh, God is putting it into Abraham's account. If you think about your bank account, it would be as if someone else deposited money into your bank. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Into your account? Praise the Lord. Good Lord. Let it happen. Uh, and then you had the money to pay for whatever debts you had. Well, that's what God did with Abraham. God said, whether you kept the law totally, and he hadn't, uh, then I'm going to give you credit for that. Anybody in school ever get extra credit for doing something? You know, So that was credited to your account uh, to help make up any other shortcomings, right? Uh, I, I don't get that in college, but anyway, I wish I did. <laughs> uh, so Abraham uh, possessed righteousness in the same manner as if a person uh, would possess a sum of money that, was, that had been placed in his bank account. Uh, so God accounted, accounted, or what was the word you said? Credited. Uh, uh, he credited it to him. So Romans 4, 4 verses 4 and 5 uh, there's going to be a distinction made between grace and works. We've talked about keeping the law and righteousness and works. Now we're going to talk about grace and works. Let's read it. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. This is where another version would come in real handy. Because <laughs> it's very wordy. But what does it say? To him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. You earn it. Right? So if I go out and work for you, mow your yard, touch your grass, whatever I do, then it, you're not having grace on me when you give me money. You're, you owe the debt. You're, you're paying a debt, right? So this is saying uh, that there's a difference with God between grace and works. And even when we work, we could never earn what God can give us. Uh, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Who justifies the ungodly? God does. So, but to him who believes in God, on God, his faith is accounted as righteousness. Those two verses really say what it said about Abraham. It says that Abraham believed God, and God accounted it to him for righteousness. Right? It's saying the same thing here. Uh, that the idea of grace stands opposite to the principle of works. So they're opposites. The idea of grace and works, they're opposites of each other. And grace has to do with receiving the free gift of God. That's what grace is about. We call grace unmerited favor. Uh, we, I've, I, think, I think Kay actually said this last week, God's riches at Christ's expense. So in other words, we didn't earn it, we, didn't, we couldn't have, a, but we got everything that Jesus paid for, right? Given to us, freely given. But works has to do with earning. It has to do with our merit before God. Is any of this saying that we should not work for the Lord? No, it is not. I just want to make sure that that's clear. It's not saying that we should not work for the Lord. What it is saying is that our salvation is not dependent upon works at all, ever. 
We're not justified by works. Uh, we're, we're not saved by works. So that's important uh, for us to understand. And Paul does a, I'm going to say it this way, a great job of kind of rehearsing things. How I many knows we don't always get it the first time, right? So he's, he's laying a foundation and he's laying similar words and, and terminology on top of that to make sure that we understand uh, what he's talking about. So the ancient Greek word that was translated grace speaks of a favor done for someone uh, spontaneously from a generous heart without any expectation of return. God gives us grace and does not expect or um, uh, yeah, he does not expect us to be able to pay him back for what he's done for us. So it's from a generous heart that God does it. Uh, of course, in the Greek, in that culture, that kind of favor was only done for a friend and never for an enemy. But God's grace, when it comes to to the New Testament, the word charis, which is charity, uh, love, and grace, uh, those words tied together. In the New Testament, it takes a leap forward, uh, and God did what he did on Calvary, even for those who hated him. Isn't that amazing? We, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we were once enemies of the cross, right? But God still had mercy on us. It's easy to have mercy and grace for somebody you like, isn't it? Oh, I'll forgive them of that. that they, I, I like them. They, we've known each other for years. I'll forgive them. I know that they didn't really mean to do that. But what about somebody that has treated you wrong in the past? Somebody who does everything that they can to mess you up. If you're able to give them the mercy, then that's God's kind of grace, right? Uh, so that's different. The grace is not we. What Paul's trying to come to here is a system of works that we do will not put God in debt to us. We can that not make God owe us anything. So if you work because you feel like God's going to owe you something when it's done, you're doing it in the wrong attitude, right? Why do we do? Why do we work for the Lord? Is it so we'll get salvation? Out of appreciation, what you say, Carol? To please Him. Because we love Him, right? And what did you say, Carol? I said win people to God and let them know what we have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so God doesn't owe us salvation. That's why it's grace, right? He doesn't owe it to us. We can never work enough uh, for the Lord to owe us salvation. So him who justifies the ungodly, so it's God who justifies the ungodly. Uh, we would expect God to justify the godly, but he justifies the ungodly. Does that mean God wants us to sin? Doesn't mean he wants us to sin, right? But it says he justifies the ungodly. So we're not justified because, and this is important, it's in your questions, we're not justified because of our ungodliness, but despite our ungodliness. Right? Aren't you glad? <laughs> We have a tendency to judge ourselves very lightly and to judge others very harshly, no. uh, So, but God judges not, uh, he, he justifies us not because of our ungodliness, but despite our ungodliness. Uh, so Paul has lined up faith and works, he talked a whole lot about them, but what he's clearly saying is there are not two ways for salvation. There are not two ways for salvation. There's not a, 
uh, Old Testament way of salvation, which is works and keeping the law, and a New Testament salvation, salvation which is grace through faith. As a matter of fact, even in the Old Testament, God always saved by faith, right? Now, they had a whole lot more laws and rules and things that, than we do. I want to say that. But when Jesus talked about the law, he actually made it more difficult in the New Testament. You know what I'm saying? He ended up. He said, uh, not if you sleep with a woman are you committing adultery. But he said, if you got it in your mind to do so, and you lust after her, then you're guilty of doing that, right? So there, what Paul's saying here is there's not two ways of salvation. It's always been one way of salvation. It's always been through faith. Uh, we don't have a different, we have a different, different covenant than the Old Testament, but we don't have a different means of salvation. Our means of salvation has always been through faith. Old Testament or New Testament, always been through faith. And Abraham is the key example of that because he was saved not because of his works, but because of his faith. Now, Paul's going to talk about one of the other favorite characters in the New Testament. He's going to talk about David. So we're going to read uh, verses 6 through 8. And uh, talk, of, talk about blessedness of justification through faith. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Use the word impute twice. That's important. Not in your questions, but it's an important term to know. That God imputes righteousness and does not impute sin. What does that mean? What does that word impute? Does it? It's grace. What? Yeah. It's, it's very similar to the same the same word that we just saw about Abraham. God accounted to him for righteousness. God, uh, except it's not as much of an accounting term as it is a religious term, right? So uh, whenever they would do a sacrifice for the sins of someone in the Old Testament, Sometimes they would use two goats. Have you ever, you ever read this? So they'd use two goats, and they would lay their hands on the goats. One would be slaughtered, and the blood would be uh, sprinkled on the altar, and all of that, which we're familiar with. And the other, what happened to it? Yeah, they, 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 they let it away. They, they took it outside of the camp. They, it was the scapegoat. That's what Carol uh, just said. So, and we've all, we use that term all the time. Well, such and such didn't really do that, but he was the scapegoat. What does that mean? He got blamed for it. He got blamed for it. He, he took the price for it, right? Paid the price for it. Uh, so that's uh, very similar. Imputed to us means that uh, he imputed righteousness, so he gave us something that wasn't ours, righteousness, and he took away something that was ours for our good. He imputed, uh, shall not impute sin. He doesn't hold us accountable for sin comes to how God justifies us. So, uh, now why does he use David as an example? Only because David was after a man after his own heart, but he had some sins in his life. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so David knew 
what it was like to be guilty of sin. More than one time, right? We all remember the, the big one with Bathsheba, but David did some other things that were sin. Yeah. Yeah, that whole thing. I mean, he he, he set up uh, Bathsheba's husband in, a, in an awful way, but that's not the only sin that David ever did. David also did a census when he wasn't supposed to. Do we recall that? And thousands of people were killed because he did it and he wasn't supposed to, right? So uh, David knew something about being a guilty sinner, but he also knew what it meant to be forgiven. That's why I, I, I've always said this. How can, you know, we, we look at David, how can he be a man after God's heart? Well, he's a man after God's heart because when he recognized his sin, he should have recognized it sooner, but when the, the time came, he asked for forgiveness, he repented before God, and he uh, tried to change, do, do an about face, do a, a turn, if you will. That's what repentance is about. Uh, so I believe that's why the Bible tells us that he was a man after God's heart. But also... He was a man after God's heart because he believed in the covenant of God. What did God tell David about his ancestry and his lineage going forward? Would always sit on the throne, right? What's that a picture for, of for into the future? It's a picture of Jesus. Jesus is the son of David. Right? It's one of the terms they use to describe Jesus in the New Testament is son of David. You remember the blind man who said, Son of David, have mercy on me. He recognized something that many people at that time didn't recognize. He recognized that David was the one that who God would fulfill the messianic line. He recognized that. At least that's what he's, it, it, it seems. So, uh, if David were judged on his works alone, then God would condemn him. But David is blessed because he has been forgiven. His sins have, have been taken from him. This comes from a commentary by uh, a gentleman named Linsky. It says, no sinner can possibly carry his own sins away and come back cleansed of guilt. We are talking about the scapegoat. No amount of money, no science, no inventive skills, no armies of millions, nor any other earthly power can carry away from the sinner one little sin and its guilt. Once it is committed, every, every sin and its guilt cling to the sinner as close as does his own shadow cling to all eternity unless God carries them away. We cannot get rid of our sin unless God takes it away. That's a, that's a powerful statement. We can forget about our sin. We can wish it would go away, but without God, it doesn't, right? Uh, without his cleansing and his forgiveness, our sin does not go away. I'm very, very glad that I know that my sins are cast away as far as the east is from the west, right? Uh, buried in the sea of forgetfulness, <coughs> right? Is what the Bible tells us. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm glad to know that. To whom God imputes righteousness apart from the works, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Uh, so David along with Abraham when we look at them uh, righteousness is given and not earned from God when we look at both of those so imputation which is the word that we looked at uh, is centered on what God places upon us not on what we do, on what we do for God so, God 
places upon us his righteousness and he removes our sinfulness. So we get a change of clothes when we get saved. I mean, spiritual clothes, right? We're, we're, we're changing. All right, let's read verses 9 through 12. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised? This book talks a lot about circumcision. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. So David's, I mean, uh, Paul is answering his own question here. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised. The unright, the right, I'm sorry, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of, the, of faith, which our father Abraham, while still uncircumcised. Woo! Mouthful. I believe that that's a mouthful, right? What's he saying? He's saying, what we said just a few minutes ago, is that uh, Abraham was counted righteous not because of his works, not because he lined up with the law, because God told him uh, that to go do all of those things before he was ever circumcised. God sent him, God called him, God said, you're going to be the father of many nations, all those kinds of things, and he hadn't even been circumcised. So it's not about the circumcision, it's about the faith. That's what Paul's still getting back to. So he's, yes, yes, it's not about those rituals and traditions, uh, uh, which circumcision was a, a part of that. Uh, so uh, it, it is about the faith. It's about our faith that we're counted righteous by faith. Not by any other ritual, uh, but by faith. Genesis 15, 6. Abraham was counted as righteous. He did not receive the covenant of circumcision until Genesis chapter 17, which was approximately 14 years later. So when you read your Bible, we don't always catch that kind of thing. That it was, God said he was accounted as righteous, uh, all of those things, and he was not even, uh, did not even have this covenant until Genesis chapter 17, which is 14 years later. So his righteousness was not based upon ritual or custom or circumcision or any of that. Is this pertinent today? Have you met people, when I ask you this, because I have, when you ask them, are you saved? I've been baptized. Are you saved? Well, uh, I took my first communion. Are you saved? Well, I believe in God. I, I believe in God. Are, are, but are you saved? Well, uh, I, 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 I go to the same church. church my granny went to. I mean, I mean, have you? I, I've had people just circular around talk to me, and they don't want to answer the question because they don't know. If you don't know. You ain't. You're, you're in some deep trouble, right? Uh, so rituals and customs and traditions do not save us. It's pertinent for today, even though we uh, it seems that Paul, I mean, it's very wordy here. It's very, a lot of talk, but when you boil it down, he's saying no custom or ritual will save you. It's only faith. This whole chapter is it's what he's He's building many arguments to, and continues to say, you're saved by faith. You're saved by faith. Not works. You're saved by faith. You're, uh, you have been imputed righteousness of God. And your sins have 
been taken away from you. So he's uh, constantly re reinforcing uh, all of this. So the Jews of Paul's day thought that circumcision meant that they were a true descendant of Abraham. Uh, and what Paul is saying is uh, you can have Abraham as your father if you walk in the steps of faith. Did you know that the Bible tells us that we have the blessings of Abraham? Well, wait a minute, I thought we had a different covenant. We do have a different covenant, but both of them come down to faith, right? What is through the shed blood of Christ in the New Testament, which is has been foreshadowed throughout all the Old Testament, uh, and one is through the shed blood of sacrifices of animals and all of that. And we said last week that none of that was ever paid the price for sin until you get to the cross. And then Jesus pays the price for all sin, past, present, and future. It was enough, right? Uh, so that, that's very important for us to see. Uh, The Jews love to remind themselves and others that they are the chosen people. I can't say that I blame them. <laughs> uh, it's an important understanding. They refer to him as their father. As a matter of fact, if you were not a natural born Jew, the religious people would not want you to say our father Abraham, but they would want to, you to say your father Abraham. So they would be upset if we were to say we're the children of Abraham. But we are, right? They would be upset with that. So Paul throws this out, and he's saying it's only through faith that you can say this, these words, our father Abraham, right? It's the only covenant that God goes back to and establishes the blessings of God is the covenant of Abraham to the New Testament Christian. It's, it's amazing because it's based on faith. And we can uh, have the blessings of God because of our faith. So the Jewish uh, readers of this letter would have been in shock. It's faith, not circumcision, that is the vital link to Abraham. It's faith, not circumcision. Um, and Paul extends this principle of being justified by faith to all of Abraham's spiritual descendants. All who walk in the steps of faith. All of us who do that. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world, that's talking about Abraham. We know that's what God told him. You're going to, through you, all the world's going to be blessed. Uh, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. God never said, if you'll keep the law, then you'll be, you'll inherit this promise of being able to bless the whole world. He didn't say that. He said, it's because of your faith, right? Uh, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. Stop right there. The law brings about wrath. But God established the law. God created the law. Why does the law bring about God's wrath? It can't be justified by, and it helps people know their sin. That, but God, wrath is poured out because then we know it's sin, like Carol said, and we still do it. Because we can't help from it, right? When we're under the law. The purpose of the law was to show us what sin looked like. 
In other words, you do your neighbor this way, that's a sin. The, one of the smallest things in there is don't move a boundary marker. Why? Because you're trying to steal from your neighbor underhanded. You're trying to take some of his land. You're trying to take possession of something that you don't own. And we're like, man, why do I have to read all this? What's it about? It's about establishing what does sin look like? Jesus sums up all of that in Matthew by saying, when they ask him, what are the, what are Jesus, what is the most important commandment? You know what they're trying to do? Trick him up. Because there were 600 and some laws. What's the most important? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, all of that. Strength, all of that. Do that. And the second, he said, he didn't let them, he didn't let them trick him. The second is like unto it that you love your neighbor as yourself. We don't have any problem loving ourselves. <laughs> um, is, is that true? Uh, unless we are mentally unstable, we take care of ourselves. We love ourselves. We don't go very long without eating. I, well, I don't. I don't know about <laughs> you, but we don't go very long without taking care of ourselves and Hopefully bathing and you know all that. Uh, when I come out of the shower, my wife says, "Oh, you smell good." And I say, "It's the least I can do." Isn't that the truth? <laughs> to smell good is about the least thing that you can do. So the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there's no transgression. What does that mean? Means you can't go better than anything. Yeah. So you don't go speed law, you ain't speeding. Right. Uh, I think. I think in Germany, I, I could be wrong. I've been told this, so let's just, just throw it out there. I've never been to Germany. But on the Autobahn, there's no speed limit, is what I've been told. So you can drive 40 or 140. Or 200 if your car will do it. Yeah, yeah, you might be killed if you run 40. So you can't break. You tra can't transgress what is not there. Right? You can't Break the law of speeding when there is no law. And uh, so it, it has to do with boundaries. Transgression is when we cross a line from holy living into unrighteousness and sin. So uh, well, when there is no law, there's no transgression. That, that tells us, uh, the law tells us when we are crossing over into sinful acts. Um, God in the Old Testament dealt with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all of that happened before the law. So we can't say that our righteousness or God's salvation is based upon the law. But it's based upon righteousness through faith. Uh, faith is the ground of God's blessing. Abraham was blessed uh, and became the heir of the world for one reason only. Faith. Faith. Simple faith. If there's a such thing as simple faith. Uh, <clears throat> Is the law bad? It's not bad. We've, we've answered that question a couple, couple of different ways. But the law is not bad. Uh, it's only because we cannot keep it that God justifies us through faith. If we could have kept the law, then that's maybe God would have said it's through the law. But we can't keep it. Uh, I love that I'm going to end with this. Uh, it's, a, it's another quote that I read. It talks about sinning. The root of sin isn't in breaking the law. It's not in breaking the law, but in breaking trust with God. I love that. When we deny God's love and care and his purpose for us, then we sin. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did. 
It wasn't just the eating of the fruit, but because they broke trust with God. That word is faith. Same word. They lost faith with God. They didn't believe that God was there for their best. They broke trust with him. Uh, so when we center our lives, uh, center our relationship with God on law-keeping instead of trusting him, then we abort his whole plan for us. So God's plan for Adam and Eve was never to live by do this, don't do this. You can do this, but don't go as far as this. That was not ever God's plan for mankind. His plan for mankind was to believe that God had our best interest for us and to trust him and to obey him, not because there was a law, but because of our relationship with him. That's what, when we break that relationship, that trust, then we move into sin. Now that's an interesting way to, to look at that. I'm not saying that you can do anything you want and still have a faith relationship with God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that whenever we break faith with God, then we step into a dimension of sin. We step into uh, a sin. It's not as much about do this, don't do this, as it is about having a good relationship with with the Lord and believing. How many believe that God has good things for us? He has a purpose and a plan. Jeremiah 29 11 tells us that. So uh, it's important for us to believe that even when we don't, when it doesn't look like it. It's easy to trust God when you got good health, plenty of money in the bank, food on the table, Kids aren't acting up. Uh, husbands living right. Uh, you know, all those kinds of things. It's easy to trust God then. But what about when, you know, the bank's calling you up and saying, you ain't got money to, to back up this check that you've given. You know, what about when the kids are creating all kinds of hell in your life? What can we trust God then? Right? Or, or, or do we break our faith in God? We, do we trust Him? Uh, I think it's a very important uh, question that we have to ask ourselves. All right. Let's go through these questions, and then if you have uh, others besides these, then we'll, we'll look at those. And then, Fiona, you can do a song. <laughs> Uh, fill in the blanks. So I'm going to read it. You fill in the blank. Abraham Believe. believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's correct. Question two. The Jewish teachers of Paul's day believed Abraham was justified by his works. Question three. Grace has to do with receiving the free given gift of God. I don't know if I spelled that out as well as I should have been teaching. Uh, works has to do with earning or merit. Question number four. We're not justified because of our ungodliness, but despite our ungodliness. Uh, question number five. Abraham was counted as righteous before the covenant of circumcision. Question six through blank. Faith. Through faith, all can say our father. father Abraham. Question seven. The law brings about yeah. wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. 